So, my mom never goes out anywhere. But she makes an exception one Saturday night. She leaves me and my little brother Ralph at home with our Aunt Donna, and she drives out to East Hampton to meet a man named George. And I know about George. I've overheard my mother talking to her cousins about him. They've all been calling him during this one hour window once a week when his assistant takes calls for appointments. Because George is George Anderson, the best and most famous psychic medium around at this time in the early 90s. At this point, I'm about eight years old. My father had passed away a couple of years before that, my favorite person in the world. And so my mom has been trying for months to get through to this psychic medium so she could get an appointment. And finally, she gets through and she gets an appointment. And that night, she drives out to East Hampton. And me and my little brother Ralph and my Aunt Donna stay home. And we watch the movie Big and we eat brownies. But the whole night, all I can think about is what's going on over at George's place, you know? I don't really know what a psychic medium is or how this stranger in Long Island is supposed to talk to my dead dad, but uh, apparently that's the plan here. So I'm a little excited and a little nervous. Like, what if my uh, mom gets too sad? Or what if my dad doesn't come through? Or what if he does and he says he's disappointed in me? So that night before I go to bed, I just ask my Aunt Donna, do you think it's real? And she says, I don't know. So the next morning, I wake up to the smell of cinnamon buns. Not like homemade or anything, they're the kind that come in the tube, like crescent rolls, that you just pop open, they're ready sliced, you throw them in the oven, but they're still really good. So I go downstairs and I sit at the table, my mom gives me two cinnamon buns, and right away I see that there's a cassette tape on the table, and the label says George Anderson. So I want to grab this tape right away and disappear with it, but I don't want to run out on, on breakfast and make my mom feel bad and lonely, so I wait until she's distracted. And then I grab the tape and the tape player and I run up two flights of stairs all the way up to the attic. And I crawl inside the attic eaves, like inside the walls. I like it in here. I don't mind that I'm sitting on jagged wood beams with exposed nails while insulation hangs down and powders my face. This is my favorite spot in the house. There's something about the enclosed space that really comforts me. So I hit play and the tape starts with George identifying my dad by his name, Ralph. And then he acknowledges that Ralph was my mother's husband, and he sees what good care she took of him in the hospital, that his, that his liver failed in the end. And he says that my dad's grandmother was there to see him through, and he's happy. He's with old friends, Vinny and Jimmy. And my mom doesn't say much. Every so often she laughs, or she says, yes, uh-huh. And I can tell she's crying, but I can also tell that it's a good cry, because she's there with my dad. And then George says, he's calling out to someone. He's saying, Nick, Nikki, Nicole. Nick, Nikki, Nicole. That's me. I am all three of those. So I hit rewind and I listen to this again. Nick, Nikki, Nicole. Oh my God. These are the best words I've ever heard anybody say. I'm picturing my dad perched on a cloud, shouting my name down to earth right over East Hampton where this stranger gets to deliver the message to my mom, which now gets to me, Nick, Nikki, Nicole. This is all the proof that I need that my dad is still here somewhere. So I keep the tape playing and I start crawling around inside the attic eaves wanting to find everything of his that I can and I come across a big hefty bag and I go in it and I find his old leather bomber jacket and I pull it on. And it still smells like him somehow and I stick my hands in the pocket and I find an unfinished box of good and plenties. And I put them back and I go deeper in the bag and I find his yellow Hanes sweatpants with the snipped waistband from when he was sick and retaining water and his gold Capricorn charm and his purple bandana and I take all this stuff out of the eaves and I sit with it on the rug. And I'm feeling closer to my dad than I have since he died in the presence of all of this evidence of his life. And I'm thinking of this stuff as sort of like his snake skin. My cousins used to have pet snakes and when they shed their skins, I, like a dark little creep, would take them home. I was fascinated by the idea that the snakes just slithered out of these bodies and carried on a separate existence. And I would hold their skins in my hands and close my eyes and even though they were hollow, they felt so whole that I would forget that they were just pieces left behind. But as I hoard my dad's things, I imagine him returning, sliding right back into this stuff that I'm gonna keep so nice for him, re-inhabiting his old skin. Thank you. Wow. Oh, yeah.